there's a school of thought where you actually have this Remo practice pad and you're sitting there trying to get like a beautiful tone out of a Remo practice pad. And that's when you know your life has gone off the rails. Yeah, what's up, ballers and shot callers? It's Nate from the 8020 Drummer, and I'm back for the second of my quick lessons I'm recording before I go to Asia. That by the time you see, I'll be over in Asia, hopefully, not making an utter fool of myself. Today, I'm going to talk about hand technique because a number of people asked me. Two years ago, I'd probably do a video like how to really play the hand technique and the biggest myths about hand technique. And I kind of have a little bit more open-minded approach to things now. I will say this. I think that any approach that preaches an orthodoxy, like there's only one right way to do it, is probably misleading. I'm gonna reiterate an adage I got from John Riley, which is essentially, if it's working for you, then you have a good reason to stick with it. And only when it starts to break down do you maybe wanna look for something more efficient. So with that said, I'm gonna talk about the two or three problems good technique is supposed to solve. And then I'm gonna give you a little brief history into the things I learned and kind of what I do now. So I think that primarily what technique needs to do for you is to make you comfortable playing with multiple dynamics and multiple speeds. So if you have a technique that works really well when you're balling, when you're playing super loud, but then your touch or your time goes to crap whenever you're playing softly, it's probably not ideal or you might want to consider kind of phase shifting it or changing it. And similarly, Totally forgot the second one. Oh, and speed. So speed's the other killer because a lot of beginners, if they try to bounce things at slower tempos, you'll get into this thing. Remember, remember, remember this? From grade school drum auditions, instead of etc. So let me talk to you a little bit about what I was taught, when, and what I do now. I really think there are three modalities for variation in stick technique. So the first is where you're generating force from. So are you generating force from the elbow? Are you generating it primarily from the wrist? Or are you generating it from the fingers? Right? So that's the origin of the force. I'm just making on the fly, by the way. Modality number two is control versus bounce. So you have extremely highly controlled techniques. Like wherever that's coming from, right? You know. Right, that's that's fast twitch type of stuff. And then you have the you know, the Gordy Knutson, people ask me to talk about Gordy. And Gordy's the master of, you know. Whether it's the classic molar of using an accent or just the more subtle kind of just gesture. So there are, there's a whole spectrum between control and bounce that I explored a little in the ride symbol lesson, but which we'll explore to solve our two problems. Ooh, I'm starting to dial this in, the three modalities and the two problems. So then the third is angle, angle of attack. So that's where this whole French grip, German grip, <laughs> yeah, I play, I play das Deutsche grip. Ooh, sacre bleu, well I play like the French. Now I want to talk to you about what I actually do today, and that is something that's primarily bounce control, where I use exactly the stick height I need, and I, I use bounce 
only when absolutely necessary because I've developed my fast twitch to a point where it can do that. So. So one thing you'll notice about this technique is that it's similar to drum core in terms of you're not allowing full rebound on the stick. You're not playing it like a timpani. But it's different in that on the micro level, you're still allowing the full rebound. So the difference between that and the, the Gordy Knudsen thing, that's a real exaggerated thing. It's kind of a micro stroke, it's just more compact. And if you consider like a, a reasonably, if you consider like a fast twitch rudiment in that regime to be kind of a series of these micro strokes I'll just put together. And the advantage to that is you can make a beautiful drum sound at very soft volume. So the other thing that I'll say about most of my kit playing is that I come from this sort of post Brian Blade school of using rim shots a lot, even in jazz. And David Garibaldi was kind of one of the early exponents of this style where it's very bipolar. There's a bipolarity between head strokes and rim shots. And that's, that's kind of where it gets the drama. It's, it's a little bit more meta way of looking at drumming, and it's definitely something that Blade developed and brought to jazz, and players like Eric Harland and the Houston folks extended on. And I feel like this, this individual fast twitch technique that I use now is very conducive to that. So, so that's my basic approach. So now let me talk to you about a couple of other things really quickly. So I believe that the way to even out your strokes is to have your fast twitch capability overlap the slowest speed where you can bounce things. So say that the slowest speed where you can bounce things and have it clean with doubles is here. That's 100% bounced. So, but then say the fastest speed that you can articulate things with individual single strokes in the technique I just outlined was here. Well, you'd be fucked six ways from Sunday because there's a no man's land between your fastest articulatable speed and your slowest bounce speed. So, and this isn't something I planned out, but it is something that just kind of evolved this way. And, Looking back in retrospect, I realized this is the single thing that solved most of my hand technique problems, was being able to get an articulated double or triple stroke up to, say, right, like that's not even breaking a sweat. That's not, I mean, it doesn't sound super clean because it's not bouncing, but if you can, if you can get your articulated fast twitch speed up into that range, then there's an overlap with your slowest bounce speed and you can just... Is he bouncing or is he articulating? Well, it doesn't matter, they overlap. So now let me speak about angle a little bit because I believe in variable angle, but I do kind of follow the Alan Dawson, Gordy Knudsen school of, and the Joe Morello, of the, the whole thing where you pick your hand up, you grab the stick, that's the angle you're at. So if you happen to be over the snare drum, it's at this kind of 45 degree angle, this American grip. And if you happen to be over the ride cymbal with your wrist rotated, then it looks more like French grip. And the one exception to that is over the hi-hat, because I do like to utilize the French grip for the hi-hat simply because... Again, this isn't something I planned out, but I found myself doing it and have probably from imitating my favorite players like Tony Royster. And I believe it's because, number one, it's 
it's such an analog to the ride symbol. It's such a similar surface. And number two, you know, it is it is still following this Alan Dawson handshake rule because, you know, your elbow is in and you're kind of like, hey, all right, let's see what this guy does. All right, you need to have it. Yeah, we see we we see where this goes, right? So the the thing I'll say is like. So if I move both hands over the hats, then you see both hands are American grip. If if I if I'm playing with the right hand, then it's back to French. And if I told you about this rack position, Tony Royster, one off thing too, that's something I encourage a lot of people to practice just because it's a lot less awkward than doing this, but you'll reach a transition point where you can play with both hands on the hats and then it looks a lot more like a practice pad in this case. So again, does that fulfill the, the, the twin rules of, can I play that at multiple dynamics? Can I play that at multiple speeds? And it does. Okay, so the overlap, the angle. So the last thing I want to address is fulcrum because I do see fulcrum as kind of a, another point where traditional modes of teaching fall down. And the thing I'll say about fulcrum is that it's really variable. And I think fulcrum is kind of, uh, taking it's like taking a snapshot of a racehorse at one point in its stride so or taking a snapshot of a golf swing or something something really variable and dynamic obviously the thing that gets taught most often is this fulcrum between the thumb and the pad on the index finger between the first and second knuckles and there are times when you will find your fulcrum there particularly If you can when you're playing the ride cymbal there are other times when it'll look from the side like your fulcrum's there like if you're playing the hats and again i'm going to turn this to the side so you can see but actually it's not really there actually and let me let me show you the other hand this is a this is a an angle you see a lot in drum magazines when you see pros playing the hats and if you look at some of my my killers on Instagram and it's an illusion because the fulcrum is not here it's actually here it's it's the back fulcrum so what do I use more 100 million percent I use the back fulcrum more so what what's the, kind of the most standard thing you might be playing at a gig I should play some head dynamics too. Yeah. All 100% back fulcrum. And the cool thing about back fulcrum, how do I define this? So I think the way to think of back fulcrum is if you hold your hand French grip, you remove your thumb, and you don't let the stick fall out of your hand, what are you doing? Obviously, these last two fingers are grabbing onto it. And that's also what solves the problem of there's sort of this tension in conventional teaching between like, ooh, you have to grip it like a vice between these two fingers, but then don't let your back fingers go off the stick, whatever you do. And it's a total misnomer because the reason why great players don't have their back stick, their back fingers floating off the stick is because they're using back fulcrum. Back fulcrum sounds so dirty, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, you into the. So what do I actually practice right now? In the past, I've practiced things like Wilcoxon rudimental etudes and Alan Dawson rudimental ritual. And I recommend both of those just because they're sort of useful real life idioms and playing through them, asking yourself those questions, is this comfortable, is this relaxed? Can, is what I'm doing working for multiple dynamics and multiple speeds? Is, is a good is a good way to do it. I think rudiments and rudimental 
solos and etudes may be like the best thing to practice. I think they may be better to practice than because it's a real world type of thing. So what do I actually practice in the real world? If somebody who's kind of an intermediate to advanced player, who's most of my audience comes to me and asks me what they should be practicing, I would tell them all of the videos I've already made, in particular the roadmap and the coaching course, because if you're playing things like and you're playing them at multiple dynamics, and you're, you're practicing your rim shots and all of these playing clean types of things, and you're continuing to ask yourself those two questions, is what I'm doing, am I able to do what I'm doing in a relaxed way at all dynamic levels and at all speeds, then you're on the right track with it. So. A lot of my lessons are kind of lightning rods, but I feel like this one is more of a like one love, everybody's the same type of lesson because the takeaway is really, it's kind of like Bruce Lee. One's, one orthodoxy or style is, is almost missing the point. It's about, you have these multiple toolboxes. You have the molar toolbox, you have the classical snare drum toolbox, you have the drum core toolbox, what have you, and you have some basic problems you're trying to solve, and you should always start from the problem you're trying to solve. Bam! So I'm going to leave it there in that kind of anticlimactic spot. I think this is the first lesson I've done in a while that doesn't have any exercises that Jesse or Tyler need to transcribe. So week off, guys! Cool. So, again... It's a nice segue here to hawk my videos, the roadmap in the coaching course. The coaching course will step you through six months of instruction as if you were taking lessons with me, but for about the price of a single lesson. It's as if you took six months of lessons with me, hired a videographer to tape it in HD with professional sound, transcribed everything, and then hired somebody to take notes for you, but it's, that's already done. And if you're looking for a gateway drug to that, I recommend my video, The 8020 Roadmap, which, again, emphasizes these real-life rudimental scenarios and outlines the three sort of secret things that great drummers are probably doing better than you while you're trying to get your singles faster on the practice pad. Nah, most of, most of my viewers are hip. I seem to have the smartest fans on the internet and that's no credit to me that's credit to you guys it's extremely flattering anyway you know i love doing this can't wait to get back at you soon one love guys be good see you soon